Romans chapter 1. We do like to extend another thank you to Richard, President of Grace School of the Bible and, and the school that everything they do for us. Isn't it wonderful? It's been a great time. Uh, I do need to make a few people feel guilty for not being here, Brother Frank and Brother Charlie, and my wife, and uh, a few other people. So they are under grace, so if they're listening. Uh, Richard had mentioned on the other day about when we come together corporately, you know, it's good to know each other. We're going to spend eternity with each other. And each one of us, when we go back, we, we're in our own assemblies. We're trying to start assemblies, talk to people. We talked a little while last night, and they want to know how long you've been in the grace message and all. And, and mine, myself, is about 1993. We came to some understanding with dispensational truths. And in 96, we met Richard and a few other people, and, and, it's, and it's just blossomed from there. Um, 2004, I graduated from Grace School of the Bible, and, to, and on this stage in 2005, uh, I desired the office of a bishop, and we started a work in our home, and that was 10 years ago, and it's still there. So uh, if you're in the Canton area, Ohio area, and you want to stop by, our home's uh, open. Well, it's not open now, but anyway, you're <laughs> welcome to come there. But my message today, and let's open a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for so much in our life. We thank you for the things you've given us freely. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, my message is about ungodliness. And we, know, we as grace dispensationalists know that when we rightly divide the word of truth, as according to 2 Timothy 2.15, that's truth against truth, correct? And it, and it tells us how it instructs us. But we also know how to look to understand, as Brother Ted shared with us yesterday, uh, how to understand the Bible. We know that how do we get profit out of the Word of God. So that's according to 2 Timothy 3.16. No matter how we slice it or dice it, guys, proper Bible study will fall in, in the three areas. Times past, but now, and ages to come. And I trust that this morning that you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, nothing else. So I'm not going to question that this morning. And I believe that God wants every creature of his creation to enjoy and be happy and enjoy the riches of his grace and his dear son. And when it comes to the word ungodliness, it is mentioned in your Bible four times, and it's all in Paul's epistles. The first time it is is in Romans chapter 1, verses uh, 18. And then uh, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. We'll call that times past. Okay? Then in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it says, And also all Israel shall be saved, as is written, Thou shalt come out of Zion to deliver and shall turn again away, excuse, away ungodliness from Jacob. We'll call that ages to come. Then in but now, 2 Timothy 2.16 and Titus chapter 2. We'll get to those verses in a little bit, but right now I want you in Romans chapter 1 and uh, Genesis chapter 3. Now, when you line Romans chapter 1 through 3 up with Genesis chapter 1 through 3, you'll really find out how us humans are. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's true. Romans, as we know, is the first book of what? Doctrine for us and for the body of Christ. And we learn there about justification and sanctification and glorification and application. It's not the first book Paul wrote, we know, but it is written where God lined it up for us to get the canon of scriptures and for us to get the basic truth to build that foundation. You know, I mentioned before, as we started our church, we started in Romans, and as Paul grew, how God laid that out, and as you grow, go through Paul's epistles, you grow how God, through Paul, grew. So if you don't do it backwards. You've got to have that foundation. And in that first chapter of Romans, chapter 1, the first 17 verses, God talks, God through Paul talks about the gospel of God. It talks about the gospel of Christ, righteousness of God, living by faith, and then he starts in verse 18, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. When we really understand the gospel of Christ and its power, you have to really appreciate that, don't we? Think about it. Because when, what Christ did for you and I, and we're not appointed to what? 
wrath. That's a blessing. Amen. Amen. And I think people today that claim to be saved are losing that focus and that God consciousness of what we once were. Think about this. Where sin abounded, grace did much more what? Abound. But sin is still abounding. And some are waxing cold and we don't see the life that should be in us. And we lose sight of the urgent need to share the gospel of Christ to the world, don't we? Mm -hmm. Think about that. We just get complacent. If we're not careful, we'll fall into and start pointing fingers at people and place us in one to three categories in Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at that. The heathen, the barbarian. The definition is a pagan, a Gentile, one who worships idols or is unacquainted with the true God. Then you look at the moralizer, the practice and the manners of conduct of men as social beings in relation to each other and with reference to right and wrong. Then you have the Jewish believer, the religious man, if you will. They are devoted to the practice of religion as a religious life. So God tells us right off the bat that wrath of God is revealed. Not that it's going to be revealed. That it is revealed against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now, wrath means violent anger. The just punishment of an offense or crime. When wrath comes... From God, it is going to be holy and just indignation against sin. We may not agree with that, but God's going to do it. So God's punishment is there, but what, what, what is the opposite of wrath? Now, this is a teaching. God, I like to hear you. Grace, peace, right? Mercy. So the good news that Paul had shared to unveil the wrath of God, we need to thank God today that Today is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Amen? Not tomorrow, today. So, what do you think ungodliness looks like? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? Or does, or does it look like that? Ah, yeah, there you go. You know, ungodliness looks all, takes all kinds of forms. But I want to talk to you about ungodliness, and it seems that when I do ask you about ungodliness, many of you said, hey, just show a video of me today. You'll see what ungodliness looks like. But, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how, while well, Richard gave me the, the special commodities relocation engineer, you know, a truck driver. You know truck driver's not ungodly. You, you, you know they're not. But anyway, the state we live in, in Ohio, they have two big temples there. One of them is the Football Hall of Fame. It's four miles from our house. You know, they, 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 they have their gods there. Fifty miles up the road is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you know what it's shaped like? Nope. A pyramid. So you think of that. When you think of pyramids, what do you think of? There you go. Yep, back to the world. Before I give you the definition of the 1828 definition of ungodliness, go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, if you're following that, you know she added some things. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her the husband with her, and he did eat. 
And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, a garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Abraham and said unto him, oh, excuse me, Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was, was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom that gave us to me be with me. She gave me the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said, uh, said unto the woman, What is thou that that thou hast done. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall they go, and the dust shall thou eat of all the days. What's going on there? Blame shifting. Blame shifting. Let me ask you, when you're going through there, God kicks Adam out of the garden, correct? Okay. Did Adam know God? Did the woman Eve know God? They knew God, didn't they? What did they do? Okay, they dis disregarded God's commandments, correct? Okay. Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, that all have sin. So at that point, sin entered the world. We agree? Okay. Instead of becoming God-like, Adam and Eve... They became ungodlike, and God placed the wrath on them by kicking them out of the garden. Did they still know God? Think about this a minute. They, the answer is yes. So what should have they taught their children about that circumstance? That God is holy, and he's just, and there's consequences, correct? Now, by, their all, by the time they had offspring... They became more and more godly or ungodly? Ungodly. And so the wrath of God, again, pours out on the whole earth. And, and the people are not that far removed from Adam. So they had, should have known what the wrath of God was going to pour out on them. So they didn't remember, apparently, what, how Adam got kicked out of the garden. So by this time, God saves Noah and his house, doesn't he? I'm talking about the flood. Now, God told Noah to replenish the earth, and with his children, I believe, they started doing that by Genesis 10. They was doing it. And by chapter 11 of Genesis, Satan had convinced the whole world to be one speech, built a city and a tower. That's a religious system, isn't it? A government. And somebody's going to tell you what to do. Now, is that what God told them what to do? Should they have to remember God's wrath? against being ungodly with the flood? See how mankind is? They forget a lot of things. So once they became ungodly, God comes down with the anger, and what did he do? He confounded the angel uh, language, didn't he? And they scattered them. So those examples, with each of those examples, what did they do? You said it a few minutes ago. They disobeyed. They disregarded God. So ungodliness means empathy, wickedness, disregard of God and his commandments, a neglect of his worship, or any positive act of disobedience. They, that disregarding is the seedbed that breeds unrighteousness. Many of you know what a seedbed is? I come from the uh, tobacco country in Virginia. We made seedbeds. You had to lay your seedbeds before you got to plant. Morris knows what we're talking about. Many of you know. But the thing is, you have to have that seedbed. Now, unrighteousness means injustice, a violation of the divine law, a plain principles of justice and equality. It denotes a habitorial course of wickedness. So when you've got that ungodly seedbed, it starts to breed what? Seed produces what? S excuse me. Sin produces what? Sin. And when you're a part of that, you hold the truth of what? Excuse me. In unrighteousness. 
Back to Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19 says, Because that which is being known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. You know, if he, God, and I believe he did this, what happened that changed man? When God put inside of every man the way to know God, what happened? We are just talking about it. Sin. They disregard God. So it's God's consciousness, and when you ignore God's consciousness, you become what? Unconsciousness. And man has known God, and we are told that, verse 20, for the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without... Everybody's is out with excuse. So God's consciousness is like a compass, if you will, that points men to who? Towards God, don't it? It's inside of you. Recently, we was talking about some things in our church, and this young man came up to me and was talking about homosexuals and laws, and we'll get that in a few minutes. And he's, he's convinced by the teachers that they're right, everybody else is wrong. Many of you probably know that. We've got kids. I've got four, and we've gone through that. I'm still going through that, some of that. But the thing is, look, I asked him without any influence from me, from teachers, in your heart, in your conscience, is it wrong to kill babies? That's what I asked him. And he looked at me and said, yes. That's the God consciousness in you. You know, it's God consciousness. So what does man do according to Romans chapter 1 verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were unthankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of, of, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto the corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creepy common things. More and more ungodliness would, would come so that God gives them up. God gives them up. They change the truth of a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, according to verse 25. This is huge, you know that? Huge. When it all said and done, there's over 20 plus things that God gave them over to. And when you get to verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, so that they com which committed such things were worthy of death, not only do the same, what does it say? But have pleasures in them that do them. Now, many of you I know have never done that. Many of you was born with a gray spoon in your mouth and you never sin and all that. I know, I know some of you. Now, I just showed you a picture of you a few minutes ago. When they ch changed the truth of God into a lie, the times of ignorance began, and it would last all the way over to Apostle Paul. That was the heathen. Remember I talked about the heathen? Uh, moralizer. The next one we're looking at, the moralizer, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, deals with the moralizer, and this guy is not like the heathen. You know, he thinks his goodness will count for being right. He, his culture, and he would stick his nose up to anyone that feels not equal to him. You know anybody like that? In my career, I'm a driver trainer. And the last couple, a couple months, I've had three or four people with me. Each one of them's different. And each one of them falls in this category that we're looking at. And we had one guy I talked about, he said, you know, he had about that much more education than me, just that much. That means a lot to some people. <laughs> but, you know, and as he was telling me about himself, he was doing good and he never did anything bad. Then he exposed himself because he had a problem with God the Creator and the authority and the man Jesus Christ. 
And he went on mock, to mocking God the Creator. Then he went on mocking me. Now, I can take you mocking me, you know, but don't mock God the Creator. So I draw the line right there, and I'm sitting over in a seat. I'm looking at him. I said, I know people like you. I've been toe-to-toe with people like you. And you cannot escape the judgment of God. If you think that science book is your Bible, then you're going to be judged out of that science book. There's another one here recently also. He kept trying to justify his wrong. Now, we have a Bible, don't we? It's our authority, isn't it not? In the King James Bible. Well, many of our jobs has policy books. And if you don't go by that policy book, guess what? You won't be around too long. And the federal government has uh, authority that governs the highway. It even affects you. So he's going on, and we're talking about definitions, and he come up to the word naive. So I carry an app, 1828 dictionary app, and it's not in there. And he said, oh, the, those definitions, they've changed. It's just like gay. Gay don't mean like what it meant 20, 30 years ago. I said, yes, it does. It means happy. He goes, no, no, that's what, no. I said, no, don't. You changed that mean. You changed it. And, and so I, we got talking about that a little bit. I said, well, what's the definition of a lie? And he says, well, it's really how you use it. <laughs> that's the moralizer. See, he's going to stand in front of God. And verses, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse, two, two, uh, verse 1 says, Therefore thou, Romans 2, verse 1, Thou for, thou art ex- inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, thou judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that ju- judgest doest the same thing. But we are, are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them that commit such things. Amen. And think of this, thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness and forbearance and long suffer, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after that the hardness and impenitent heart treasured up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness of God uh, of God. Who will render to every man according to his deed? You know what this guy's doing? He's going to point their fingers and judge other people. You know, he's going to judge God. Can you imagine that, knowing what you know now? You're going to judge God? Brother said, that, uh, that, I think that, that, you, when you stand in front of the judge of Christ, it's going to be you and who? And you're going to point your finger. Think about that. My first speeding ticket was 45 and a 20 mile an hour. Ungodly, I know. I know. <laughs> Since then, I had many. <laughs> but anyway, I looked at the judge, and I reared back. I said, Your Honor, I want my driving record to speak in my behalf. I'm like this, right, because I had a clean record. He said, Son, your driving record's not in question here guilty <laughs> what am i gonna say and i've had several since then i learned that i'm at the mercy your honor you know and that that sin that tends to help a little bit you know <laughs> but anyway you know the fine might the fine's still there it's just the punishment is not as great but look he i was guilty guilty but you know we as humans go and try to justify everything we do we do. Even we do. <laughs> Even we do. But look, Romans chapter 2, verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What privilege does this man have? None. That, his respectable sinner status falls right into the ungodliness as the heathen did. So what does it get him? Well, God's judgment is according to truth, verse 2. 
according to accumulated guilt, verse 5, according to his works, verse 6, without respect to persons, verse 11, according to performance, not knowledge, verse 13, and verse 16, God's judgment reaches the secrets of his heart. That lines right up with Genesis chapter 3, verses 11 through 14 that we just read a little while ago. So when you, when, you, when you see finger pointing and the blame shifting will continue into chapter 3 of uh, Romans. And it will deal with the Jew that knows the law but is also what? Condemned by the law. You know, after the Tower of Babel, man did not retain God in his knowledge. Correct? That's what the Bible says. And so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They are abandoned to sin. And we know in times past that God took a person, Abraham, out of him and formed a people that would be his agency to a lost world. That people was Israel. And they had advantage over the Gentile, correct? We know that from Ephesians chapter 2 and so on. Advantage and disadvantage. Gentile and uh, uh, Jew. But God through Paul addresses the Jew here in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 2 verses 17 through Romans chapter 3 verse 9. We're not going to read it, but that's where we're at. And God addresses the Jew and he tells them that they rested in the law. That they boasted of God. That they knew his will and was therefore able to approve things that are excellent. He, the Jew, developed a a confidence in himself to guide people. He was a light. He was instructor to the foolishness, a teacher, because the law he had, the form of knowledge and of the truth. That's what he was. That's what he boasted in. But did he apply it to himself? His teaching, his preachings, you know, his sayings, what folks should be, the hoarding of idols, the glorying in the law, the name, you know what, the name of God was blasphemed, you know that, amongst the Gentiles. So how could a Gentile turn to a religious Jew and find the God of the creation? He couldn't because they was doing the same things that he was. You heard that old saying, God, you know, God did not save us to continue in sin, did he? Because you, if you did, you might as well just stay where you was. So the covenants and the wickedness of the Jew and the selfishness and the pride, he was no different than the other two types of people that we looked at. And what we're going over so far, both of those people are is showing a disrespect A direct disrespect of what God told them to do. Hence, ungodliness has been the issue that we've talked about. So, we're in a room full of heathen. We're in a room full of moralizers. We're in a room full of religious Jews. And they're giving you the what for, right? They're telling you everything that they deserve. And it's not the wrath. So, you, get, you hit them with Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 says, What then? Are they better than they? No, and no wise. For we have both before proved both Jew and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Verse 10 says that, in, uh, that there is none righteousness, no, not one. So, they all have failed at something, didn't they? You know, people come in, you're a good man, Ed. I'm like, there's none that do it good. I'm not good. There, verse 11 talks about there's none that, that understandeth. They all become willfully ignorant. There's none that seeketh God, uh, seeketh after God. They all seek their own righteousness, don't they? They all gone out of the way. They had deliberately turned their backs on the truth. They all together un- became unprofitable. They, be- be- they have dishonored God instead of glorifying Him. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. They- their practices are evil. They do not follow that which is good. Their throats are as an open sepulcher because of the corruption is within. With their tongues, they have, uh, dis- uh, have 
use deceit. Lying and deceitful is their characteristic. The poison of asp under their lips is the poison inserted by the very nature of the man by Satan at the very beginning, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, for out of the abundance of heart the mouth what? Speaketh. Their feet is swift uh, uh, to shed blood. Hatreds produce murder. You, many of you read this and uh, know this. Destruction and misery are in the ways because they have forgotten God, the source of life and blessing. They, the way of peace have they not known, for they have deliberately chosen the ways of death and found pleasure in them. Didn't we read that? Found pleasure in them. They is, there is no fear of God before their eyes, hence there is no wisdom in them. What can they say? Hey, what can you say? What will your friends and family say? Or what will your enemies say to that? Here's what God says. Now we know the things whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under law. For every mouth shall be stopped, and all the world have become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's ungodliness. Ungodliness. Now that was in times past. Amen. But what about but now? Is un ungodliness still around? Hey, I just walked through Bourbon Street a few minutes ago. <laughs> I've been on Bourbon Street, the real one. But there's nothing ungodly about that. But look, 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, 15. You know, Brother Richard talking about the music. I love music. I really do. I love all types of music. And I like the beat. But I like to change the words, too. You know, and I go down the road. I look at the world through a windshield, people. And if you know a true truck driver, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're marriage counselors, they're insurance salesmen. We solve everything. <laughs> and we solve it before we get out of our truck. And some of us already assume that you know that. So... You know, look, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. That seedbed of ungodliness, you know what it will result in? Look at verse 17. That the word, their word will eat as doth a canker of whom Hamias and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past and overthrowed the faith of some. When you don't rightly divide the word of truth and know how to divide it, that uh, it will increase, and the profane and vain babbling over and over will increase in godliness. You know, it's funny, I've I got to say this, couple nights ago, I guess a couple Saturday nights, how many watched Forgotten Truth? Okay. It just became, it came on dish not too long ago. And a couple, uh, two, two Saturdays ago, I get a text. And Brother Richard's talking about something about the law. Uh, I forget what the, I should have wrote it down, but something about the law. And somebody texted me and said, he mentioned a, a grace church that uh, or, uh, grace believers meets in a police station. And calls them Little Grace Church under the law, and and, and, he, and, he, and he, he's like, and he said he's talking about us, you know. And I'm like, really? That's important. Richard said if you give him a million bucks, he'd buy TV time. That was a good plug, brother, because they knew who they was talking to. We we are known as the Little Grace Church under the law because we do meet in a police station. But anyway, I just had to share that with you. But second, go to Second Timothy, uh, verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3. More and more ungodliness. That seedbed of ungodliness, it's still around, guys. Chapter 3 says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their, their own self, covenants, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, 
false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, trady, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of what? Godliness, but denying the power thereof from such party on. <laughs> what? Turn away. There's people out there that's got a form of godliness, but denying the power of That's that doctrine. You don't want to line up with them. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and, and leave, led captivity, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' love, lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. You know any people like that? And he gives an example. Now Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. So do, the, also the, uh, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth. Faith. Faith, thank you. Doesn't this line up with what we read in Romans? Even through Paul. God said in Acts 17, verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. The times of that ignorance back there in Genesis chapter 11 is over, guys. It's over. But we, you know people are still going to be willfully and remain ignorant, don't you? You know that. You know, recently the Supreme Court made a decision about homosexuals having a right to call, be, you know, marry in the States. And people's just, you know, flooding everything. Honestly, I have to tell you, it saddened my heart. It really did. Because, you know, you as a Christian knows it's wrong morally. You should know it's wrong morally. But what did we just read? What do you expect? We have an opportunity today, There's, and that window's going to close, because people searching, what does God say? What do you say? What do God say? People's looking for the government to tell them what to do. People's looking for society to tell them what to do. They're looking for a culture. But what do you tell them what to do? You know, I had a young girl come up, and she said, I have friends that are that way. And they tell me, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to accept us the way we are. And I looked at and she asked me, what do you do? I said, you know, they're taught that. They're making you feel guilty. You be who you are in Christ and you share them the word of God because they are a cure for that stuff. Amen. You know it is. Amen. So what do you expect? That, did they follow God in their consciousness? Their ungodliness. Second, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Is that times past? Hath appeared? It's already here, guys. Okay? So it's already happened. Then it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world. That's but now. Soberly, righteous, and godly. That affects your spirit, soul, body, don't it? You're made up those things. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearance of God, the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what grace teaches us. I get tired of hearing people, but I'm still saved. I'm going here and sin. I'm still saved. I get tired of that. You know, to me, that's a cop out. I know you sin. I know I sin, but I don't want to use that as an excuse. So when God appointed his apostle that stated, if a man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, you're spiritual today. Let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So when you disregard that, guess what you're doing? You're disregarding God's command. That's ungodliness. When you don't follow the words of God according to your apostles. Then we have ages to come. You know, during Israel's program, and in times past, they became so ungodly, they did not recognize God himself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know that? He stood there in the midst of them, and they totally ignored him. They said, crucify him. 
That's sad, isn't it? We could, we, we're thankful for that he did that, but it's sad that they're all, his own people that he came, he loved that world so much that he came to die for it. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it said, And so all of Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. There are going to be a time over here that God's going to come back and turn their ungodliness. And in Ezekiel, for the sake of time, we won't turn there, but he says he takes his children of Israel among the heathen, and he's going to put them in the land. God's going to put them in the land. United Nations is not God. And that really disturbs a lot of people when you say that. There are, there, God said he is going to take them out and he is going to place them in the land and he is going to put a sprinkle uh, clean water on them and he is going to cause them to walk in their statutes. They're not going to be ungodly. But the ones that's left behind there, over there, they're going to go to the lake of fire. So Israel would be redeemed and their hearts would be right with God. That's going to be a blessed time over, isn't it? In closing, I want to share this with you. When I'm witnessing, I ask people, do you know Jesus Christ? And I ask them, do you know where you're going to heaven? Just ask them a few things. You ever notice people, when you say that, they get defensive? Like, is this a trick question? Or, you know, I'm just, I'm just asking you. Because I'll wait for the hear the reply. And that tells me where I need to go next. Remember, the people that we're talking to are either in Adam or in Christ, aren't they? And Or they're a heathen, they're a moralizer, they're a religious person. And in the book of Acts, this has helped me greatly. There's three types of people in the book of Acts 17. The first is the, is the Thessalonians. And Paul says reasoned out of scriptures and opened them allegedly about the death, burial, and uh, that Jesus was the Christ, and some believed. So he walks into a church building, and he opens up the books, and he shares about the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, that church building could be a bunch of religious people, couldn't it? Not that they're saved, right? So he said that some believed. That's one type of people. Then the second group of people in, in Acts is the Bereans. Everybody wants to be a Berean, right? You've got to study your Bible. It says, They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Whether it's those things. Now you've got a group of people that's going to search the scriptures to see what you're saying. They're a little bit more advanced, aren't they? Okay? Then you have the people in Athens. Now, they worship a rock, the unknown God. They did not know the Lord Jesus Christ, people. So what did Paul have to do with them? He took them right back to Genesis. And that help, has helped me identify the people that I'm talking to because you have to know where they're at. And when you find out where they're at, you can springboard and you can, and you can and go on. The times of ignorance are over, guys. And we need to let people know that when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. Father, we do thank you for so much in our life. We thank you for the things you've given us freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.